I've been overwhelmed a bit uh, this weekend, and uh, this is the first found, uh, first NSS conference I've come to where I've been both an entrepreneur and a, and a guy who talks too much in front of people. And uh, so it, it's gotten a little hectic, you know, standing there having a business meeting in the hallway, going, oh, I'm giving a lecture now. So um, first, you're, you know, you're obviously going to get a little real, quote unquote, real politic out of me. Um, and then we'll, we can have some Q&A and stuff, and I'm going to go that way with it. Um, as you may know, I, w I was a big supporter of Returning to the Moon and, and uh, worked on a book uh, called Return to the Moon, which originally I was going to write, and I thought I would save a lot of time by getting 22 of my best friends to do essays for it. If I had known how hard it was to get 22 people to turn in on time, I would have written it. It would have been easier. Um, but uh, take a look at that. It kind of gives you a, a perspective. Uh, my perspective on, on the moon and the return of the moon. I want to start by uh, also saying something uh, very, very clearly. It is not a question of the moon or Mars. That is a false dichotomy in my world. It may not be in other people's worlds. In fact, if, if I were able to sit down and instantly produce a new book right now, that book would say all of the above. The moon, asteroids, Mars, you know, wherever you want to go, you know, strap on some gills, go to Europa, I don't care. It's about all of the above. Um, you know, and I've been, a, again, a fan of this and, and, and pushing the concept of the moon, and so I'm going to take this out a little warm, um, for a long, long time. And, you know, I was very honored to be invited to hear President Bush make his vision speech. Uh, and, and it was a very exciting speech, and, uh, and I've, I've said some of these things before to some of you, some of it's new, but I sat a few feet away from him, and, and I was lucky, I was one of the few activists to be invited by the, the White House to that, and I'm sitting there, and I'm a Texan, so I'm looking at a Texan, and, and Texans, at least in some ways, are good at spotting each other's BS, and, and I think that he absolutely did mean what he said. He absolutely meant it. He was very serious about going to the moon. He was very serious about staying, and, and that was music to my ears. Talking about permanence is, is what it's all about here. Um, and uh, I was thrilled by that, but I gotta tell you, from the president's mouth to NASA's ears is a distance greater than from here to the universe, and as many things can happen to somebody traveling that distance, including an idea and a message. And it did. In the first phase uh, after that, uh, after the VSC was announced, there was a lot of excitement by a lot of us. Uh, we really thought something great was about to happen. And um, we put aside our, our, our fears of what could go wrong. We put aside our, uh, uh, it turns out, well-learned instincts that something would go wrong and began to, to, to cheerlead for the cause. Um, I was honored by uh, a, a very strange set of coincidences occurred, and that was that, um, not coincidences, they weren't even, and then they weren't even that strange, but a group of people inside NASA that had become friends, oddly enough, during the Mir, what we call the battle for the Mir, um, who were my opponents at the time, but were honorable opponents, had now become friends over time, as that often happens when you're no longer in a, in a conflict situation, and had moved into the headquarters area. And I found myself being invited to uh, quote unquote secret NASA meetings in, in Maryland, and being flown out on NASA's tab, which blew my mind incredibly. And um, we sat in a room with uh, about a dozen people who, who shall remain nameless, but one of them gave a speech right before lunch that everybody seemed to be quoting. And uh, we're all sitting in this room talking about, well, how can we realize this vision? And how to, and, and my hope had been that the president would say, go to the moon and I'm not gonna give you a lot of money. And that would force creative thinking, which in any semblance of a logical, rational world would then lead to creative ideas and doing things differently so that you could achieve the result necessary in a rational world. Without whatever it is in the air filter in a certain building in Washington that controls our space program. Well, that didn't happen. What happened was, slowly we began to see a recreation of business as usual. And of course, business as usual at NASA has a tendency to uh, focus uh, on edifices, either flying or operational edifices, doing large and important things in a board, uh, involve large sums of money, 
going to very, very powerful constituencies. Uh, those constituencies are political, those constituencies are center-based, those constituencies are business-based, uh, but they're there and they're huge and they're very, very powerful and when lots of money shows up, they kick into gear very quickly. Um, and so we began to see this happening, but quietly there was a group of us having these meetings, co-conspirators in the palace, perhaps. Um, and we're having these meetings about, well, how can we start twerking it around? How, how can we get to a frontier enabling return to the moon. I want to back up for just a half a second because I see a lot of new faces here. And, and I do want to say that um, there is a very clear difference in the way you do things depending on what your long-term goals are in space. If you're going to play and not to stay, then it's okay to throw everything away on the way. That wasn't meant to rhyme, but okay. <laughs> but that's the way you can do it. You know, and that's fine. Your goal is getting there. Apollo, your goal is getting there. And when I say play, the play of nations is, uh, as opposed to the, the play of individual human beings, the play of nations is let me get to the top of the hill, be the biggest and baddest, come knock me off. That kind of play. And that was what Apollo was. Um, Apollo was defined by going to the moon first, fastest. We're the biggest, baddest on kids on the block. You know, don't mess with us. And that's, that's what it was. It succeeded magnificently at that game. If their goal had been to stay, it was an utter and complete failure. And, and, and I honor all those people who did it. And, and I love them and Buzz, and they're my heroes. But um, the, the, the goal that, um, that was sent out by the president did, did talk about staying. And unfortunately, what we were seeing was it's the beginning of NASA going in another direction and going in that game of play and feed the constituencies. If you're going to stay, you're creating a frontier. Your goal is to get there, create a beachhead, and begin to reduce your dependency on the mainland, shall we say, on, on, on the people you've left behind. You begin to reduce your dependency immediately. You create systems that are robust, because you can't be fixing them all the time because you're there doing other things. You have to use systems that are reusable and recyclable. Space people who are in a frontier mindset are some of the biggest environmentalists you've ever met, okay? There is, there is no bigger environmentalist than somebody floating around the earth in a, tin, in a, sealed, tin, a sealed tin can, viewing the earth down below, breathing their own recycled air and drinking their own recycled urine. You're really an ecologist at that point. You are living in an ecology. So, um, and I love that because it throws off this environmentalist versus thing. I don't like that. that that's a bad argument to me. We, we trump all the old discussions. A frontier-oriented program is one that is designed to create an ever-opening wedge that opens into a, into a broader and broader and broader set of activities. A frontier-oriented program, you don't go take all your money and pour it into uh, you know, loading up an orbiter with all kinds of scientific instruments to study the history of the moon. That's not what you do if you're going with a frontier-oriented program. What you're gonna do is find the best landing sites, find the most resource risk, resource rich landing sites. That'll get cleared up when I have a beer later. Uh, resource rich landing sites. You're looking for the ones with the lowest delta V uh, required to go to and from. You're looking for accessibility. You're looking for other useful traits, depending on what it is you plan on doing there to create your economic system. And so um, that was a very interesting thing because what happened was with these little meetings, the first meeting led to the creation of the, uh, what was called the LEAG, Lunar Exploration Analysis Group. That group was scientists and the, the idea was if, if NASA, the transportation people, the big money, where all of, you know, the power and the lobbying and all the games are concentrated, was going to be focused on carrying people there to do something, it's almost like wagging the dog. If we could get the geologists and the scientists and all these people to start doing the right kind of thinking about pioneer science and frontier science and staying, then maybe we could change the system that was supposed to carry them there. After all, the, you know, again, in a logical world, you're building a transportation system to carry people somewhere to do something specific in a logical world. Now, so here we go, and I'm gonna come back to that logical world part in a second. 
because we got in there and we started working with the scientists. And it was wonderful because the lunar scientists were so hungry, man. They'd been waiting so long to get back to the moon. You know, you could just show them a picture of the moon and they're like, yeah, whoa. You know, so we were, um, we were talking to these people and we started talking to them about, okay, well, here's, here's how we'll get you there. You're going to have to put aside some of your, you know, wanting to study the history of the solar system right away. Because the, the taxpayers have given you some, some seed corn. You can eat it or you can plant it. Don't eat it this time. Let's just get there. Let's learn how to live off the land. Let's lower the operational cost. Let's do what I call frontier science. And frontier science, and I, I remember it because I, I really suck at PowerPoints, and I was down at JSC at one point in front of a bunch of these guys. And I, so I became a human PowerPoint. I said, okay, now this slide would have shown um, that here at this end, we're, we're, we're doing frontier science on this chart. And as we move over time, and we come, become better and better at living off the land, this curve goes down. The amount of frontier science that's being taken on in dollars and the, the time of astronauts and robots um, is, is going to go down, down, down. And then this wedge is starting to increase. Pure science starts to grow. And then eventually, by this time, when you're getting a, a fully operational, economic, economically self-funding outpost, by that time, by the way, it becomes a community or a settlement because you've moved into a, a, a different social strata than an outpost. At that point, you're maybe doing some exports. You're maybe making a little money. Well, then you've got resources to do lots of science, and you start far, you know, going out all over the moon and doing all kinds of cool things. And, and it was interesting, because we were in a meeting at one point at, at the second LEAG meeting, which at that point was then 100 people. And we had the uh, Mars rover teams there, and we had all these scientists, and we had them all in a room, and we broke into teams. And we're looking at all this stuff, and there was this great moment where I heard a little light, saw a light bulb go off, where one of the old um, Mars, lunar and Mars scientists, the, I can't remember his name, he's the one who at one point thought he had found fossils in the Antarctic or something, and uh, Marswell, something like that. Great guy, great scientist, uh, but hardcore scientist, you know. Uh, was sitting there, and he goes, you know, while you're digging the trench to pull the regolith out and throw it over here, I could go down there and study the strata on the history of the moon for free. I was like, yeah, now you're starting to get it, okay? It wasn't like, oh, you're taking my money away from me doing it, but I can leverage off what you're doing while you're trying to create a, a viable uh, habitat and, and systems on the moon. So they were starting to get it, and it was really exciting. Well, around this same time, um, a group of people got together uh, on the inside and started pushing some of us along. Jeff Taylor from Hawaii, Paul Spudis, Mike Duke, some of these other great people that are involved in lunar activities, and Wendell Mendel. Um, and they started uh, kind of pushing myself and, and, and whatever up to the front and saying, you know, you say the stuff we can't say. You know, come on, show up these meetings and say these things. And, and so we started doing that. And then, uh, there was a guy named O'Keefe in charge of NASA at the time. He was basically a bean counter. He had come in to help correct the uh, price overruns of station and that kind of thing. He was on his way to other things. Really, I don't think he could spell space. He was just in the job. Um, but he put a guy named Admiral Steidel in charge of the lunar program. Now, Steidel was a Navy guy and was innovative in the world of, Na of the Navy. And he had done some cool things there. Wasn't a free enterprise guy at all. Innovative in the government world. It was like a, a more innovative bureaucrat than the other guys. Nice guy, nice guy. Steidel, though, the great thing about Steidel was he knew what he didn't know. He knew that he didn't know this stuff. So he put together a bunch of roadmap committees, and he put all these committees together to go study these things and educate him and his upper staff on how we should do these things. And over time, eventually, the uh, Jeff Taylor, who's one of my heroes, great guy, University of Hawaii, if you ever get to hear him talk. He's funny and he's brilliant, and he's you know, and he'll say something savage and you'll be laughing. You realize he just savage, you know. Uh, but anyway, we uh, we got into this meeting. Uh, we, we were invited now to come and speak to Steinle at the last roadmap meeting, and I put together a team of uh, David Gump, um, who had been with LunaCorp and and you know, as you know, went to T Space. Uh, Tom Taylor, who comes from the the Kistler uh, side of the world. Um, Jim Muncy who is the, the god of space, new space politics and knows his way around DC like nobody else I know. And we put together a presentation and I said to the guys, here's, here's the deal, we are not gonna go in and pitch our individual thing. We're doing a, an end-to-end -end presentation. 
and you know, you're going to do policy and sustainability. Sustainability as in how do you keep the program alive through multiple administrations? That kind of sustainable, political sustainability. Uh, Gump was going to talk about marketing and uh, economics and how you set things up like that. Taylor was talking about building a basic infrastructure. I was kind of like junior ringmaster. You know, look, the elephant's dancing. And so we got in there in front of Steidel, and there was this big room with the head of all the different centers and all these scientists and major university people all sitting in this room. And we did this presentation. And it was supposed to be about a 45-minute presentation. Two and a half hours later, Steidel you know, pulls up, and I swear, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm kind of a, in the medieval you know, type thing, and, and I swear he was like the king in court, you know, when he reaches for his sword, you know, like, he's going to cut our head off, you know, kind of thing, and, he, and he, in a sense, he goes, okay, he, he, everybody stops, and he goes, this is, this is incredible, I had not heard this stuff before, and he says, uh, Rick, I want you to keep this team together, and I want you to report directly to me, and there was a guy named Frank Schoengard who was working there in charge of commercial stuff, and he goes, Frank, I want you to get these boys some money, um, and, and uh, I, I want you to report to me. This, this is the greatest thing I've heard. And I remember Mike Duke uh, from Colorado uh, Mines, uh, what, University of Colorado Mining, whatever, goes, he, he, Colorado School of Mines, thank you very much. He goes, uh, do you really mean that? <laughs> yes, I do. You know, and then I think Jeff Taylor said, do you mean that? You know, yes, I do. I, I, this, is, this is great stuff. I hadn't heard this. In, you know, put together in a big picture. Because again, these guys are from all different sides of our field. And, and uh, they said, okay, let's do this. Um, and, uh, and I remember, because uh, Jeff Taylor, as the four of us were getting up, walking by, Taylor goes, I think you just changed the whole moon program. Well, good. Um, so the next day, um, they're doing the more, now the NASA presentations are coming up from the centers. And a guy gets up from um, JSC and I can't remember his name, nice guy, gets up and starts showing their architectures. Now, at that point, up until that point, NASA had had what I called the hopscotch version, which is um, we're gonna stay here on the equator, uh, you know, on the highlands here for four days, and then we're gonna go over here and we're gonna do 12 here, then we're gonna do 30 here, and we'll do 90 here, and yes, now we're ready for Mars, goodbye. Okay, that was the original plan. It was, that was the one that was the, the real highlight at the time. And, um, and he, he's, he does this thing, and he gets up and he goes, okay, we're gonna do this, and this, and this, and then he looks back at where we were, and he goes, that was the plan, until yesterday. <laughs> S swear to God, people were in the room, a lot of people in the room heard this happen. And um, at that point, um, he, he keeps talking, and he flips it over and he shows this other one. And lo and behold, there's a little wedge there that says commercial activities, just a little small one, starting to grow a few years in. Now, they still weren't getting it all the way. Keep in mind, you're going through the, whatever those gases are in the air filter, they're still running around their brains. So they're hearing it, and you're, you know, you're showing them a butterfly, and they're saying something with wings, you know, and they're not quite getting it, but they're starting to see something with wings. And he said, uh, he said well, you know, here, here we're going to start some commercial stuff. The term they were using was what they called abandoned in place. In other words, at that point, we're done with it. It's surplus. You can have it. Well, now we're feeling our advantage and we're starting to press in and it's like, no, 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 you know, you, you know we don't, uh, I, I remember Wendell Mendel pops up and he goes, well, what you need is a good exit strategy. I said, no, no, what you need is an entrance strategy where you have the private sector involved at the very beginning with an understanding that they're going to have to take this stuff over. And he gets into the, uh, the near frontier, far frontier model, which I'll talk about in a moment. Anyway, at that point, he, he says all this and then he keeps, and he falls back into some other NASA's stuff, and Steidel comes back over and starts, comes back to us, we're sitting and brings over Schoengart and starts talking about how we're gonna get a study money. Well, it was fantastic, it was great, it lasted for about three weeks, and then O'Keefe left and Mike Griffin and his team came in, and it ended. The, only, the difficulty with Mike Griffin, and we were all very hopeful when he came in, the difference between Mike Griffin and, and uh, forget O'Keefe, but Steidel, who was in charge of the moon part of it, um, was that Steidel knew what he didn't know and wanted to learn. Griffin came in and he knew, capital K, I know, my team knows, this is what we're doing. Okay, and that is a problem because there was no learning to be had. And everything we had done up until that point was thrown out the window, unfortunately. Sort of. 
because what happened then was those ideas, the ideas, the frontier-oriented ideas, where you go to one place, you build up on that place, you use the resources you find there, be it the, the differential between the hot and cold that you have in the permanently shadowed and permanently lit parts of the moon. And I gather you probably talked a little about this before I got into the room, right? Okay, good. Um, I am not a scientist. I just drink beer with people who think they are. Um, anyway, they, uh, using all these resources, the, the fact that you have, at the same time that you have these high extremes, overall you have a mean temperature, et cetera, that's more mellow, and et cetera, et cetera, all the great stuff. The ice in the, in the possibly, the ice in the shadowed areas, those kind of things. You put all that together and you, you go there. And every time you land, you add another module and another way of processing materials. And, and you build and you build and you build and you build. And you begin handing that over to the private sector from the beginning by inviting um, Caterpillar to come out on your first flight and test a miniature bulldozer on your first lander. And, and by inviting these other companies who are non-traditionals, is what we call them, non-traditionals, to come in and get involved. And that's where we were going. Um, and um, so that was all gradually being worked in the back rooms now, quietly. Unfortunately, NASA went back to what it normally does. And it wasn't just Griffin's fault. I want to be clear, it wasn't just Griffin's fault. We had actually an exchange of letters where I was pushing, pushing him pretty hard. And, uh, and I remember, uh, I actually read one of the letters that you were there at the SAS where uh, I, I said, you know, we, we need you to do commercial stuff. Um, we need commercial transportation systems and NASA should buy its ride. And, and Griffin came back and said, look, you know, I support commercial activities, but I have a mandate from my president to go do this and I can't bet on the private sector um, uh, doing it for me. You know, I can't take a gamble. That was the phrase. I love the fact that he said that because what that did was it gave me an opportunity to say to him, well, it would be a gamble to bet that the commercial sector could pull this off as far as creating a transportation system that would enable permanence. You're right. It's absolutely a sure bet that your traditionals will fail to do so. So you're really not gambling. You really aren't. You're right. They're going to fail. And it's going to happen. This whole Ares project, forget it, it's going to collapse. It's over. It's not going to happen. Um, and God forbid if it does, you know, let's, let's take a bunch of solid rocket boosters from Morton Fireball, Thiokol. Oh, no, I'm sorry, ATK. You know, with, and put more O-rings in the stack and make a top-heavy booster with control systems at the bottom so that when you shift, it goes like this all the way up. Yeah, let's do that. That's brilliant. Um, no, that's not going to happen. A uh, little aside, I think that's going to run some course, if it's not canceled within weeks, they're going to run it along until a new administration comes in, of whatever party, because parties hate, you know, when a new president comes in, he doesn't want to have to carry the weight of somebody else's vision. No, no new president is going to want to carry out George Bush's vision. It's not going to happen. It's like, yeah, I think I'm going to follow George Bush's vision for Iraq, okay? It's not going to happen. They're not going to go down that path. You know, unfortunately, and I'm not saying I agree or disagree with that, but I'm just saying that's the politics of it. They're going to be able to say, well, the new administration killed it. We tried. Now, in the meantime, it will have done the job of pump pumping billions of dollars into the traditional aerospace companies, Marshall Space Flight Center, JSC, KSC, Maryland, uh, oh, Utah, ATK is based there. There's a long story there. Go back and read the books about Challenger, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those people will be well funded, the standing army, and George Bush's brother state will keep fun, being funded, et cetera, et cetera. That'll all happen. Um, but that, that project's not going to come to fruition. It's just not. Um, so anyway, what happened was, uh, a after Griffin came in, he made, according to Wendell Mandel, a very unfortunate statement several years after announcing, or a couple of years after announcing that we're going to do this transversation to go, system to go to the moon. He was publicly asked, um, well, what are we going to do on the moon, Mr. Administrator? And he said, I'm paraphrasing, but it's close. I'll leave that to the next administrator to figure out. Well, that's a rather unfortunate statement if you think about the fact that you're building a transportation system to serve the end users that you're taking somewhere. Okay, so it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. We're gonna build a really cool rocket because our president said we're gonna go to the moon permanently and then somebody on the moon can figure out, you know, they're going to do something maybe with this rocket and, and you know, and, okay, it's a Ferrari, we'll figure out how to put the shovels in the seat later, behind the seats or something later. I, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. So NASA's response 
the people in the palace, their response, the good guys in the palace, was to put together a, uh, a workshop last spring in, in DC. And it was great. This workshop, they brought in, um, I want to say several hundred people from all over. I mean, Friedman was there, Zubrin was there, I was there. Uh, there were people from the partners there, there were Europeans, there were Japanese, there were people from every center, Warden was there, all these people were there. Uh, and we broke into groups. There were, I think, six or seven groups. And we all looked at what can you do on the moon. We finally, after the program started to tell us how to get there, they finally went back and said, well, we should figure out what we're gonna do when we get there. And we sat down and everybody in this, these groups started working out things. Our group came up with 137 things that could be done on the moon that would be useful, economic, etc. cetera. Um, and it was very interesting. Then the groups were each asked, why do we go to the moon? What's the top level rationale? And again, very diverse group, all kinds of people. Um, even Scott Horowitz, the guy who, who built the solid rocket booster, who came up with the solid rocket booster idea that did get perverted even beyond his own idea, uh, was in the group. All these people were there. Every one of these groups came out, and it was on a, on a Friday, and I remember it, um, because the top headquarters official in the room left, like during half the presentations, didn't hear them, but their own people got up and said, our group says that permanence is the goal. Another group got up and said, our group says settlement is the goal. And another group got up and said, permanence is the goal, one after the other. I think it was five out of six or six out of seven said permanence, and the other one said, you know, sort of permanence. That was amazing to me, given the kind of groups and the diversity of people in this room. They all said permanence, and they realized that permanence was the goal. And again, if permanence is your goal, you do everything differently. But it was too late. We're already rolling down the rocket path. So how do we get permanence on the moon? We get permanence on the moon by, first of all, getting NASA out of space transportation from Earth to LEO. It, we hand it to commercial, uh, to commercial providers. Buy the ride, not the rocket. I'm gonna step back for a second and give you what I call my, my model of space. It's out of my little, what I call Rick's handy dandy guide to space. And I, I use this little handy dandy guide because my head would explode because I'm around really smart people and I have to do little diagrams and stuff for myself. In my way of looking at space, there's the near frontier and the far frontier. The near frontier extends from the surface of the Earth to the furthest point out that human beings have actually walked, the moon. Far frontier begins at the moon and beyond and, and goes outward. The near frontier inward, business plans make more and more sense. Or conversely, going back out, the giggle factor reaches a roar at about the moon. If you're doing a business plan as a commercial operator. The closer you get to the surface, the better. Now, far frontier, it's a perfectly good area where you're not really going to make a near-term financial profit in any real-world scenario, okay? I know at this conference there are people in some rooms who, you know, using unobtainium and several billion dollars that are going to be given to them by aliens who beam them into Arizona somewhere are going to be able to come up with something great. I understand that. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the real world we live in. Um, and the fact is that beyond the moon, it makes sense for people in cultures, in nations, to pool their resources in the form of taxes and support um, exploration. In other words, they're, they're, you're, you're investing in cultural wealth, wealth, scientific wealth, the Lewis and Clark function. That's where agencies like NASA belong. Or, or geographic societies as well. You can do it that way too. That's where your pooled resources go into exploring new domains that may not return immediate profit within the realm of, of business norms. That's fine. Near frontier, private sector, closer and closer, you culminate in LEO. LEO is exactly where the private sector is ready to go. From now on, NASA astronauts' jobs should not start in, in Florida. They should start in orbit, okay? They should take commercial transportation to LEO where they will climb upon ships that are being assembled there or, 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 or cycling there or whatever method you want to use and go from there outward. By the way, the primes, the big contractors, can work on systems from getting from LEO to the moon. That's fine. You know why? Because I don't know any private uh, entrepreneurial new space firms who can build that capability yet. It's coming. 
They, some may claim they have it. There's always one or two people who think they're exceptions to the rules until five years later when you ask them, were you the exception? Oh, okay, no. No, I've gone back into the private sector, the real one, you know, I'm doing computer programming. Um, so we let the primes, we let the aerospace contractors do that kind of stuff, you know, the, uh, the advanced prop propulsion systems, exotic technologies like that. From Earth to Leo, private sector buying the ride. Now, in LEO, it is imperative that we build what I call an industrial economic infrastructure. What some people ignore, and what I love to chide my friend Bob Zubrin about, is Mars is great. It's a great destination. This isn't about destinations. It's about sustainability and economic viability. You cannot make an economic, via, uh, an economic argument for Mars right now, except in one case when it involves human beings. And that is if you're taking their ticket money and sending them on a one-way trip, then you can make some money. But they ain't coming back. There's an argument you could just keep throwing enough people and supplies out there that eventually, you know, it's like if you throw something long enough, something will stick. Maybe that'll work. It doesn't really work in our culture to do that kind of thing, but it, it could be cool. You know, it could be cool. Um, what you have to do is be able to create an economic system wherein you can realize profits from the place you're going to in an ongoing and increasing way. That's how frontiers are opened. That's how civilizations expand. The only reason we were able to really create a viable economic um, entity in North America was that the nations of Europe had had a thousand years of trading coastally with each other and gradually along those coasts with, Near East, with the Near East and Asia, etc., They had learned how to build ships, how to build ports, how to navigate. They had learned how to hire crews, or in some cases, impress crews. They knew how to value trade goods. They knew how to put teams of investors together and take risks on, on sending a ship down to, you know, Araby, as they would have called it, and doing some trade. And, silks and stuff and coming back up. They knew how to take risks. They had government entities that knew how to protect those teams of investors and those kinds of things. They knew all of these different things and they had gotten gradually and gradually and gradually better at it. It was a familiar idea, the concept, pool resources, make investments, take a risk, make some money, do it over and over and grow your business. They knew that. That's why North America succeeded. Well, we don't know how to do that with Mars. We don't know how to do that with the rest of the solar system. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't have any clue. We need cards. Uh, I'll wrap it up in about one minute. Okay, good. And um, so anyway, the point is we have to create an economic system. We do that in LEO. We get up to the moon. We go for permanence. We live off the land. We begin trading back and forth to LEO. We can create value there. But LEO is where we're going to make our first money. These new space companies, by the way, are all about this kind of activity. We grow our way out. We begin trading to and from each other. And by the way, once we learn that LEO bridge, we duplicate it in a larger sense to the moon and asteroid, near Earth resources, whatever. Some people are going to want to go there. You learn how to do this. We duplicate that bridge span. It gets bigger. Okay? Then, at that point, we know what we're doing. We have the trade entities. All these investment seminar people that were here the first day of this thing have now become, you know, it's 20 years later, and they're good at it, and they know how to insure each other. They know how to make profits. They know how to interact with private sector companies. Somebody's made money at a widget they've created on the now soon-to-be-abandoned space station that's been taken over by commercial entities, et cetera, et cetera. Bigelow's rolling along. He's ready to do work, you know, he's doing the space adventures thing, spending people around the far side of the moon, except now it's a cruise ship, things like that. It starts to grow. We're comfortable in that domain. Once you've learned how to build that bridge, once you've learned how to, how to sail that ocean successfully, how to navigate the shoals of that ocean, and how to realize profit from the far shores of that ocean, you can then duplicate those voyages anywhere you want to go, and the solar system opens up, and then the universe follows. Thank you very much.